we, are we ready? Yes. Okay, we'll do it. Ready? Okay. And much more. Welcome. Today is Thursday, October 13th um, to the school committee meeting. Um, I'd like to open the session. Is there any public participation? Great. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. There's none. Okay. Uh, so we'd like to invite up, um, actually come up and, and say your name. Um, we're going to discuss um, an update on the school trips that are being offered for the year. I'll introduce uh, Melanie Contadakis mm -hmm. and Rebecca Bradley, who are both teachers here in the high school. And welcome. And, uh, who just came in is our assistant principal, Bill McCarthy. Who has more facial hair and I didn't recognize Good evening. Do you want to set it up? Sure. Well, we got some STEM uh, here I should say Melanie, Melanie Constantakis Schwartz. Oh, yes, that's fine. <laughs> I go by both. I know, I know. <laughs> well, um, one of the, one of the um, efforts we have been looking at as a, a school district is being able to offer um, more opportunities for students to be able to do uh, traveling, particularly international trips. Um, as you know, last year we uh, put together a global competence certification, and as part of that, one of the one of the uh, requirements of that is to do some form of travel. And um, so, in that effort, we have been seeing more people that would be interested in supporting and chaperoning and, and all the work involved in providing uh, these opportunities to students. And tonight we're gonna uh, mention a few of them. The, the, um, the actual trip information you have in your, in your packets in Novus, and the approval of those trips is in the consent agenda. So we, unless you wanna change it and, and, and vote approval after a presentation. So we've invited um, uh, our staff that are going to be chaperoning these trips, organizing them, to come and talk about them since in a couple of cases, these trips are new trips and in the past when we've had a new trip we've had people come in and talk about it so you have a chance to answer ask questions that they can answer them but with trips that are that you've seen before but there's just some details then we just present the information and someone doesn't come to present so that's sort of background on the uh, on why they're here tonight great okay would you like to talk about the trips sure start so yeah. Uh, my name is Rebecca Walsh Bradley, and I'm an English teacher at the high school. And um, Tim Martin and I, uh, Tim Martin is also an English teacher at the high school, are proposing a trip to uh, over spring break, uh, April break, um, to uh, England. Uh, it's an eight-day, or it's really a nine-day trip, but a travel day on each side. Um, the students would spend four days in London, and um, and then they would spend three days in the countryside, which would include Oxford, Stratford-upon-Avon, Bath. Salisbury and um, Stonehenge. Uh, I just want to uh, the I want to tell you the favorite day or my favorite day of the trip is actually the last day of the trip in London, um, and that's because Tim and I kind of we were able to work with a company which is Explorica and um, add and subtract a bunch of things um, based on what we thought would both um, sort of. Uh, interest the students and would be the most educational. And so um, day eight is we would visit um, the Tate Museum um, and uh, probably walk across the Millennium Bridge, which is really cool. Uh, we were going to go to the Charles Dickens Museum, which is actually the house that he lived in in London and worked in, um, and it's supposed to be wonderful. We would also go on the um, London Eye, which is really just fun. And uh, finally, we would end the day with a um, uh, uh, visiting, or sorry, watching a production at the Globe Theater. Uh, so there's lots of great stuff on the trip, but I think of all the days that day, um, I think is pretty amazing. We have a lot of interest so far and um, are hoping to um, get even more. Great, any questions? Yes, Mr. Hainer. I, and this will go with for all the trips and stuff. I noticed in that particular trip it said uh, for scholarships there's one for every six. Is that limited? It's, it's, so, scholarships? yeah, so um, 
we were ho right now we have between 18 and 20 students that have shown a lot of interest um, if we so if we get 18 students we would have one free spot because the other spots cover the the cost of the chaperones traveling so six students would cover Tim and then 12 would cover me and and then so it wouldn't be until we hit 18 that there would be a full scholarship available I guess my question is to the school department or whatever, if a student is not able to pay, and say you had three of those students that would be like that, what do we do? Dr. Reddy, you wanna? Well, there would be options in this. One would be to divide it three ways. Another would be to, take, to reduce the cost for all of the students. Uh, we're, so there are options with, um, with, this I, with, the, with this extra position. No, I'm, I'm not ta talking about, I'm, I'm saying if you had three students showing financial need under what's going on right now is potentially there's only one, would the school augment for the other two? What I'm saying is that it it's, has a cash value to it and it can be divided by three if there were three students that but, had need. But what if three students, that would not, if, if a student sincerely wants to go, would there be a complete scholarship? Yes, that's an, one of the options with this as well. It could be a complete scholarship. Okay. One of the things that um, I feel very strongly about is trying to find money to provide some scholarship for students. Whether we can be in the position of having an entirely uh, free trip, I, I'm not sure that that is probably a possible or even ideal. Because what we're, we're hoping to do is to have enough notice with these trips that students can help, you know, earn some money to for the for the trip. And in fact, our our long term goal on this is to actually have a calendar of trips as much as two to three years out. Again, and, and in fact, one of the trips we're going to be talking about is a trip we used to have here, and kids knew about this trip when they entered the high school. Mm -hmm. And so they might have had three <laughs> years or four years to prepare and save for it. And I do think it's important for students to, to do that because they're more invested in it entire, instead of entirely giving one, a whole complete free trip to one student. I think it's very, very important that, that trips are available to everyone, not just to uh, those that did financially afford it, I, I think the idea of having a calendar several years ahead of time, I think that gives opportunities for even the community to support these programs and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest coming back, not only sharing with us the results of the trip and uh, have the students come in, but share it with the community as well so that they, they understand and get, become invested in it in the future. Um, may, may I add one more comment on that? Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, um, we have actually talked about this before. Um, the financial need of, of some students to um, be scholarshiped on these trips. Um, I think you're all familiar with Mary Villano, the former principal. Um, one thing she's been working on is developing a, a fundraising program throughout the year that would create a, a, a cache of money that could be pulled upon, not just this year, but in years future, um, for that very reason. Um, you know, there's different events in mind. It's still getting started. So there is nothing that's set in stone yet, but we all agree that there is a need. Great. Thank you. Great. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yes. Okay. All right. uh, would you like me to talk about South Africa? Yes, that'd be great. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. If you have more yes. questions about London, I don't want to pull away if there's sure. more. No, nope. sounds okay. okay. Um, so uh, I'm Melanie Constantakis Schwartz, and um, I am proposing that we take a trip to South Africa this February. Um, this is a slightly different kind of trip. It's not a tour per se. It is focused on a cultural and service-based learning trip. Um, so the students would go to South Africa. We would be, um, we would visit the uh, prison where Nelson Mandela was held. We would be out in um, some of the environmental habitats, like there's some gardens there that are amazing environmental habitats that are one of the only places in the world that you can see certain species of plants and fish and birds, etc. cetera. Um, I'm desperate to go to the, um, it is a baby panther cub sanctuary. I don't know if we'll get that in there, but just because I, I like cats. Um, uh, we're also doing a safari, and the 
bulk of our time, however, will be spent out in the townships. Um, we'll be working in the schools um, in the black townships that are desperately underfunded, unlike anything we see in the United States. Um, the students will be working, um, providing some fun activities for the students at recess, doing some reading tutoring, some support, and just trying to bring some extra hope and light and life into those communities. Um, so we'll be doing that for five out of our 12 days. Our trip is a little bit longer. The killer thing with South Africa is um, the travel time. Yeah. Um, it's actually uh, surprisingly quite affordable um, because once we're in country, it's not that expensive. It's the um, tickets that are so pricey. And because we are spending so much of our time doing service work as opposed to uh, more traditional tourist things that would be very pricey, um, it comes to being a relatively affordable trip overall. Um, to address um, Bill's point about affordability, um, we are definitely looking at that. I'm going to be approaching um, the Martin Luther King Committee and the Human Rights Committee to see if they would be willing to donate towards some of our cost of the trip um, and to kind of bring the overall cost down. With the, um, oh, it's totally slipping my mind now. Kathy just mentioned it. The international, what is it, the, that we have students get the certification of? Um, the global certificate. Oh yeah. Right, and there is some funds in that for travel, right? Isn't there yes. a $250 scholarship in, in embedded in that? Um, so we're hoping that's something that students will also um, be able to use towards this trip. And we're trying to find as many ways to bring down the overall cost in general to make this as, for, as affordable as possible. The students have also spoken to me about what they might be able to do to do some fundraising. Um, so it's definitely a concern um, and something we take really seriously because we want as many people to have this experience as possible. Um, so uh, something we're, we're really aware of. Great, thanks. Any put questions? A, I'll put a plug in too yes. for what Melanie's okay. talking about. We, we, we are looking very seriously for funds. We had, for one of our trips, our Japan trip last year, we had a member of our community mm -hmm. donate mm -hmm. a, a, a complete scholarship for the trip. So what I'm hoping, and we're starting to begin, Bill was talking about this, of, of creating a fund that we would have as a source for scholarships. So if anyone in the community would like to donate to such a fund, <laughs> Please know that uh, we are looking looking for that, and in some instances we'll be looking at on needs base, some a combination of uh, merit too. So we we have a um, so combination someone, of so factors. Someone in the community wanted to donate. Would who would they? They could send it to the Arlington Public Schools expressly for uh, you know scholarships for foreign travel. Great. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank Yes, and the tour company we're going with is offering a scholarship as well for students who show um, exceptional leadership and community service as well. So they're offering, um, I believe it's $500 off um, for a student that the faculty nominates um, as well that feels that they, they would really benefit from this trip. Great. Thanks. Any other questions? Any questions? Great. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Bill McCarthy. I'm the assistant principal at Arlington High School. Uh, I just wanted to start off by saying thank you for taking the time to hear us on these trips, and uh, thank you to Rebecca and to Melanie for helping plan these. These are incredible opportunities for our students. Um, I've always been a believer of hands-on learning, and you can't get more hands-on when being placed in the country, whether you're going to a panther cub. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> or going to the Globe Theater. Um, I think it's an outstanding opportunity that we afford these students. So the trip that I'm proposing, um, we have done in the past, as Dr. Bodhi has said, uh, it's, uh, it's through EF Educational Tours, and we will be touring through uh, Krakow, Poland, and Prague, the Czech Republic. Uh, I've actually been part of this trip, I think this, this will be my fifth time. Um, the trip is being run in conjunction with Marie Radoazzo, who's a retired teacher here at Arlington High School, my former mentor, and Rob DiLoretto, the Dean of Students in Fusco House at Arlington High. Uh, the idea behind the tour sprung from a course that Marie used to teach here called the Literature of War and Genocide. 
Uh, I took that course on when Marie retired, and the course has since evolved to be, uh, be entitled Missing Voices. And it covers a broad range of different groups that are underrepresented, whether it be in literature or in the world. Um, so this trip itself would pull upon that curriculum as well as the curriculum of the U.S. History Department. Uh, and what we would do is um, the three main sites we would attend would be the Terezin Concentration Camp, Oscar Schindler's Factory, and Auschwitz-Birkenau. Uh, the trip itself right now is set up for 12 students from Arlington High School, and we would be traveling with 12 students from Matignon High School, mm. and currently one student from Reading High School, um, but we would see how that, uh, that works out. Uh, the trip would be after school, it would be during the summer, it would be in June, um, and as I've said before, we've uh, done this trip five times. It is very moving and emotionally powerful. We do talk to the students at length about the history of the Holocaust, its impact to the world, uh, how we still feel, feel its presence in literature. Uh, I was actually just seeing last night, there's a new movie coming out um, that deals with Holocaust denial mm, right. and f rebuking that. So, um, I don't know if there are any questions about the tour or, or places we'll be going. Any questions? Yeah, uh, yes, mm -hmm. Dr. Allison Anthony. I, my question kind of applies to all of them and it's actually more of an administrative question. I'm thinking back to when there's been varying levels of unrest um, in the world mm -hmm. over the past few years and that we've had questions of whether we should change plans or, or things and I understand we can't possibly predict the future, but I'm wondering if as part of the notification and literature that's given out to parents for the trips, if we should be giving something that says, just basically a, a big explanation that we can't, just what I said, that we can't predict the future, that we follow State Department guidelines for whether or not the student should go on the trip, um, and but we're not trying to micromanage you know, I'm, I'm thinking about when there were bombings here or, or in Spain or in places and that we feel, I think following the State Department guidelines is the best thing we can mm -hmm. do or we should come up with whatever it is that we decide, but that we should be also conveying that to the parents. Mm -hmm. As okay. you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Similar to the message we give about snow or <laughs> some yes. other. Yes, I, I have lived through those, uh, those times and have been part of a situation where we've had to cancel a trip that has happened. Um, and we do use uh, the State Department guidelines on this. And we could put a disclaimer in our, in our forms that, you know, th this could be subject to cancellation uh, should there be an incident that um, there is restricted travel put out by the State Department. Our hope, of course, is this will not happen, but that's a good point. Now, I think that our, we, one of the things we've insisted on uh, all of our trips is that the travel insurance be part of mm -hmm. the cost of the trip. I mean, we've, that is, used to be optional, but said, it can't be optional. It has to be there. So I think that we would be covered in, in case this happens. Right. So it sounds Actually, think, speaking yeah, of that, yeah. um, all, uh, there, I think there are two points. Um, one is financially, all three trips, if there is a, um, a State Department issues a warning, um, there is a, an insurance policy to pay back the students if it is deemed unsafe to go. Um, but I think the other concern is just letting parents know that there are, unfortunately we do live in an unsafe world yes. at times. Yes. And we want, I mean, I mean I've traveled with both Melanie and Rebecca before and, and multiple other teachers and whenever we travel we obviously want to put our students first in our priority of taking care of their safety, but there are liability concerns. We don't know what's going to happen. Um, but having traveled with both of them before, and, and I, I do know that we would put the students first, but it is important to, to make parents aware of that. So I do know we hold parent evenings where we would talk about the trip and any concerns that might arise from it, and we do open ourselves up to emails if they have our questions at any time if anything does arise. Um, traveling in the past, I have gone to Vietnam, Morocco, Spain. I have traveled all over the world. And I can recognize the 
for the parents, it's, it's a huge issue of trust. They're trusting us to bring their child on this trip and to bring them home. And so we, we recognize that we do keep those lines of communication open, whether they're cell phones, emails, while we're on the trip and leading up to the trip. So I, oh, I, I, it sounded like I was thinking about similar to our inclement weather sort of warning where we say this is our policy, but of course, if any parent feels that there's that situation right. that's safe, that's at your discretion or something like that. Although then there'd be a financial implication to that. Yeah. If a parent chose on their own, because they felt then, and it wasn't sort of officially canceled, mm -hmm. they would assume the financial costs. Correct. Mm -hmm. yes. I think that Mr. McCarthy better captured my concerns mm -hmm. that, that just mm -hmm. to convey to parents that we know it's an unsafe world, but we feel it's important for the kids to get out in it. But still, you've got to know that there, you know, there's problems. We'll do the best we can to avoid them, but there's problems. So. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Anyone want to sign on for the trip? <laughs> I want to <laughs> sign on for all of these trips. <laughs> uh, no, these are going to be in the cons so these um, the vote for this will happen in the consent agenda. It'll be a routine unless one of our members pulls it out. Um, but we just wanted to have the opportunity to hear about the trips and ask any questions. So Good. thank you for coming. Just real quick. Yes. Is there a New York trip, or is that something totally separate from you folks? No, there is a New York trip. Mm. It's, it's, it's separate from them, though. Just got changed. So, so what I understand is these are not all the trips. These are just so a, right. these are these, these are, are three of the larger international trips. The New York trip is actually for our international students. Right. <laughs> oh, right. Um, they will be going down to New York, but as Karen said, the, the dates have changed. So I believe once I get that information, I'll pass it along to everyone. My only concern was that on the agenda it said it's stated originally approved on that date. I know this is a recurring trip that we do for the international students on a regular basis. Right. We approved that one in 2015 for that specific one. I, I just don't want... Under the consent agenda, we are going to approve... Right, the but the way it was presented, it says originally approved. I see. Oh. The well, concept, concept was originally approved, but each individual one is going to be approved separately as it comes yes, forward. Thank absolutely. you. That's all I wanted okay. to make. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank so you. We should clarify that. Thank you very much. Thank you um, much. Yes. Very Thanks. exciting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and I... Um, which Miss, I did not welcome um, Miss Higgins, our AEA rep at the committee, and today we have a student rep, uh, Lucy Vogus, is that? Vogus. Vogus, sorry, um, who is a school council member. Um, and we, it's been our tradition from time to time, we've sometimes fallen in this tradition to have uh, student reps at our meetings. And we welcome the opportunity to hear from students. So I invite you to go back to the committee. If there's something that you might want to talk about or present, um, just give us enough time you know, to sort of put it on the agenda. But we'd love to hear um, your perspectives and your concerns. And so um, I, I welcome that. So thank you for being here. Um, OK, so next on the agenda. Um, so. Uh, the next thing on the agenda is the buffer zone report. As I understand, Mr. Remy was not able to make it tonight, so we need to push it to the next meeting. Mm -hmm. um, Could yes, I ask for a copy of that report ahead of time? Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, so we didn't get the copy, so right. he wasn't able to make it. Um, so uh, the diversity hiring report, Mr. Spiegel. Thank you. So you have the report in your um, packet in, in Novus. It's very similar to the same format as previous years. Um, showing the the staff that we've hired um one th explanation um that is sometimes confusing is the total staff that we had last year mm -hmm. in the different categories didn't they didn't all carry over to the previous hires who started this year um, when we ran the report um last a couple weeks ago um and that's because there was some attrition some people resigned or um or left the district for various reasons. So that's why the numbers um, are a little bit lower from the previous hires than the total staff and why we're, our gains are not great because right. we are not retaining all the staff that we hire in certain um, ethnic categories. Or um, So it, it is making it challenging to um, increase our diversity as much as we would like. We have had some good hires this year in a few uh, key teaching positions in the district. Um, we have hired um, um, Asian American teachers at the elementary level and special education in kindergarten. 
um, Hispanic teacher in social studies at the high school and um, black and African-American teachers um, and social workers in the district in special education and in, in social work. So, and then we have other new employees of diverse backgrounds from in other job categories, obviously, teaching assistants, uh, cafeteria workers, bus drivers, substitute teachers, um, and, and others. And we, you know, continue to, um, to strive to increase the diversity and it is it is challenging um, to always retain and we also need to focus on retention mm -hmm. of all the the employees that we do have mm -hmm. questions comments mrs starks um i'm going to ask the same question i asked last year which was i would like to see these as percentages and i would like to see what the percentages are of students mm -hmm. okay so my goal would be at some point to have it you know they match it, they match, right? They're, they're, we're trying to move closer to ma making them match, but I don't really know what those are. So I would love to know, well, what are the percentage of students that are, that rep are Asian, black, Hispanic, Native American, white, and what are the, what's the percentage then of staff that meet those as well? I, well, I can't, can I answer? Yeah, um, yeah. I, I, off the top of my head, I can't tell you by each race, but what I can tell you is that um, the percent of white uh, teachers is about 84 percent mm -hmm. teachers and professional staff and whereas our students about 75 percent are white so there is a disparity and the goal is that there is more congruence between the two mm -hmm. which is why we have the the you know, efforts we have been trying to oh, recruit yeah but retention um, retention is an issue we've looked at various things having coffees within the school year for our our teachers of color those have had mixed reviews and sometimes people don't come they're it, it's they're busy we've had fact more we've had more people from the diversity committee than we've had sometimes the staff um, but I think one of the things that we we work on is certainly the social emotional climate of our schools a robust mentoring program um, and just raising that consciousness of what a welcoming school is. is. And, but on the other hand, um, we are more competitive than we used to be in terms of salaries, but we are still not com as competitive as some of, some of our surrounding communities, for sure. Well, and I know this is a problem that all districts are having. I, all and districts maybe we are. are not unique in this at all no, um, we're not. And as a matter of fact it would be interesting even at that high level to understand what other well, even yeah. if we just used the ones that we normally compare ourselves to mm -hmm. it'd be interesting even at that high level if we know that we are you know 75 percent and 85 percent mm -hmm. in arlington mm -hmm. Well, what does it look like in Belmont? What does it look like? You know, at some point, it would be interesting mm -hmm. just to know because I think it's important for people to understand we're trying very hard, but this yeah. is a real problem, right. and it, we're, not, we're not unique in our position. I don't want people to think mm -hmm. that we're not trying, and I know we're trying. I've been right. to those coffees. I know, I know that it's hard to find those people. But. Mr. Spiegel, would that be so, easy to get, do you so think? From the, other from the other districts? Um, I could request it. <laughs> I will see. Um, yeah, just so we could, if you know, we can. We, even if we just do the town manager. Town manager 12 committees, oh, yeah. right. Yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, I could try. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I just lost my thought. I was going to, um, something city. Well, I'll just, maybe, maybe we're thinking the same thing. One of the things that is a, a challenge for all districts is that only 13% of the students in teacher preparation programs are are, are, are professionals of culture <laughs> and so right away that is not many people that are being trained to right. be teachers right. Right. which is why we 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 as a district supported that you know today's students tomorrow's teachers right. because this was the sort of a long-term approach to how we're going to change the co the course of that and hopefully that still will, um, we'll see. At some point. And At some point, resurrect itself. And as, as you know, we're members of the MPDE, and we hosted, we, last Friday, the MPDE hosted a very interesting and successful day-long conference 
touching on, on the topics that all school districts are, are grappling with in, in this area um, and had presentations by Claude Steele, who was fascinating, mm -hmm. talking about um, bias and stereotype threats and his, his research, um, how, how that works in, um, for minority populations in whatever the minority um, is in different situations. Um, and uh, John Safier spoke, and he was great. And other panelists, and Kat, uh, Dr. Bodie was also part of a panel. And it was just, you know, there was so much to cover, and it, the day went really fast with because there was so so much to, to talk about and go uh, what's going on throughout the state. Um, and people from the Department of Education, and um, and Lesley University, and people really brought their perspectives on 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 this this issue that um, in terms of just making our profession, um, the education profession, more diverse and welcoming for everybody. And I think a lot of professions, a lot of industries, a lot of different uh, uh, all across society is are grappling with the same, same issues and almost no matter what field you're in. Um, I did want to say, speaking of the coffees, we did hire a couple of the new teachers had come to the coffee social in the spring. Good. So That's we good. were able to sort of follow up, and principals did follow up with those some of those candidates who matched openings that we had. So it did work for a couple people who, who came, um, um, and we were able to, mm -hmm. to do that. Uh, yes, Mr. Hainer. Something I just noticed in this, uh, from 2014 to 2015, there's, we hired 130 teachers. From 2015 to 2014, we lost 46 teachers. Is that something we should be, or excuse me, staff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I realize yeah. it's, yeah. not, it's not yeah. just staff, but it is staff. We had that large increase and then decrease. Is I guess my question is, is that budgetary? Uh, is it programs that we're not continuing? Or is it something we should be concerned with? From 14 to 15? From 14 this is probably, to This is a, a question staff. about general but staff, it's, right? It's, staff, it's, overall staff. It, these are pretty big numbers, is, uh, I'm oh. just yeah. concerned. And we've I, increased we, our student We added 104, uh, 130 from 14 to 15 on the total staff and then dropped 46 yeah. from 15 to 15. This I'm is, looking at the far yeah, right no, I column. Yeah, I see what you mean. And I, I'm just, con I, if this is something, I'm not looking for a specific answer right now. I'm just, con if it's budgetary, budgetary, we need to know about it and, and decide how we're going to allocate the money. I don't yeah. think it's budgetary. I think there were some, I know there were some positions that were, I, we just finalized a hire today for a position that was vacant. Um, so we've had some vacancies. I don't think that, that explains all the, the difference. I'd have to look at, there's also, Substitute teachers is uh, that's listed oh, in, in these see. numbers are as well. incorporating these numbers, and the substitute numbers fluctuate greatly. But and so, substitutes we, you're including are full time substitutes, they're not the day to day ones. No, right? it includes the day to day ones as okay. new hires, yeah. Okay, because they're on our staff, they're hired, we take their we get their data. Um, so, and some substitutes who haven't been working, and we've I, I, taken I, off of I our just gonna ask roles as, as a person who was substituted some years, I'll be in two or three days a week, other years, two or three times a year. Yeah. If I was a minority, would you be, where do If you, you didn't work all Right, year. where do you, do, the, do, do I automatically get counted if I show You would once? get counted if you're, unless you're inactive for um, several months, then we would deactivate you. But if you are working periodically as a substitute, we would So you wouldn't this get counted if, if you maybe worked one day the past year or something? You, it sounds like you wouldn't. It depends get. when. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and it was months this ago. This is not a reflection <laughs> yeah, on you, okay. but I think that's important yeah. for we us could take to that un understand. Uh, uh, out. Maybe, yeah. maybe a, a slight break. How many of the the the, the staff would be considered mm -hmm. uh, substitutes? Right. Just to put it in perspective. Yeah, that's all. Dr. Allison Anthony. Um, Mr. Spiegel, I remember you spoke in another meeting that you do exit interviews um, for departing staff, and I wonder if you've gleaned anything from. Um, the more diverse staff in terms of what, you know, why are they leaving? What, um, were, what are the needs that we weren't meeting? You know, uh, for different reasons, but uh, there's no one common um, denominator for why, or co common reason for why staff are leaving. And our diverse staff who've left have different reasons mm -hmm. for leaving. Um, you know, I. Uh, you know, obviously not everybody who we hire, and I've said this before, 
is in what they feel is the right job for them. Sometimes it's we don't feel it's the right job for them. And um, and sometimes, you know, um, they're looking for different opportunities. Sometimes, um, you know, sometimes that really they're they're looking for a different type of working environment. People and across the board, people who have left, um, no matter what race they are, you know, variety of reasons a few people it's more money mm -hmm. a lot of people it's because they are moving or they have a spouse or partner who's been who is being transferred elsewhere and they're moving out of state and it w they wouldn't have left otherwise other people you know some people aren't looking for other opportunities but other opportunities find them and they have a hard time saying no I mean there's every reason that people leave and, and obviously there are some people who are dissatisfied and we try to we would like to minimize the number of people who are leaving because they're dissatisfied. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Mr. Slickman. Yeah, I, I would definitely, you know, I'm doing the data dashboard for Lowell. And yeah. We've got, we, we pulled, have you seen the Boston dashboard on their diversity? I think I've looked at it. Yeah, it's quite interesting. And you've got a slidey thing based on year of hire and you right. can mark off by classification. So, you know, people in the district can readily look at um, uh, how we're doing in, in various categories and, and it's really quite cool. Uh, I, I, I agree, I'd like to have the per diem subs out of the report okay. or categorized differently because that, that's a, a totally different kettle of fish. Uh, the opportunity for a, a student to interact with somebody on a day-to-day -day basis, even if it's a long-term sub basis that, that that's fine okay. but the per diems just to me don't okay. really warrant inclusion in a report such as this uh yeah that's the one thing i did notice is the the, the attrition rate and if you've got per diem subs in there that could certainly yeah, <laughs> influence yeah. that uh and, and i guess everybody's asked about our, our what we're doing to uh, look at look at attrition among uh, people we value in the district right. so uh, uh, if anything comes forward that might help us to uh, retain people that, that's systemic enough to bring it to us you know we definitely want to hear about it sure so I just have a question about that so is the attrition in those categories of jobs that we normally get attrition uh, no matter which you know um, group they're they're put into or is it so that I know that for example a sub or a aid there's just much higher attrition there's much rate. higher attrition right so I, I will say there was more i think i mentioned this once bef in a previous report there was more attrition this year okay. among our teaching among staff teaching staff okay and so people in that in the it, aea bargaining a unit a bargaining unit got it for various reasons there were more people who were okay. for you know had spouses transferred out of state i mean it just seemed like there were several people who fell in that category i mean and there were just a a lot of different Including reasons. Including people with diverse backgrounds. Yeah. I, mean, I think so. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. I have to think, yeah. Yeah. And we had a couple people that, you know, reduced their hour to hour and a half commute to, you know, 15 right. minutes. That's the yeah, other so, thing. We had some people yeah. with long commutes who really, who decided that for family reasons or whatever, they needed to have shorter commutes, so. Okay. okay. Great. Thanks, Is Mr. Hammond percentage in people that come in like first year teachers second year teachers and then leave I, I guess from this I, past all, year or all, all I can remember is I would when I needed a job I took a job no matter where mm -hmm. and I lived in Arlington and I, it was a 40 minute ride northwest once I had the job if I had moved out there I would have had the experience on my resume and I would have been able to be more selective of where I went I didn't know if that was a factor as well mm -hmm. I know we were a great training ground for a lot of different people in us. Yeah, system. I don't think that was a huge factor. There were a couple people who were newer employees who left to do other things, to not teach anymore, actually. So, because we had a couple people who left the teaching profession. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next on the agenda, um, Dr. Chesson, State Accountability Data Report and Analysis. Okay. Uh, um, can you want me to I guess I can do it. There we go. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we probably should turn the light down. Okay? No, I think we should turn it down. Introduce it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so again, as we do each year, we'll talk just very briefly about the components of accountability, um, talk about the accountability results for this year and our plans to move forward. Um, before we go any further, one of the things I need to say that it's very unique about this year is that we, um, with the school committee's um, approval, took the park this year. Mm -hmm. um, in order to get accountability numbers, because as you may remember, we use data from previous years on a weighted average to, to get that. Um, in or because those years were MCAS years and this was a park year, uh, the state did a um, crosswalk where they took um, what the student got in park and they translated that into what they would have gotten in MCAS. Mm -hmm. Park has five ratings, um, MCAS only has four. Mm -hmm. In some cases, the top of the three became what we would call proficient. Mm -hmm. okay. The top of the middle range became into the proficient. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, the bottom of the four became needs improvement. And, and I, I say that just to let you know that there's a lot of okay. manipulation of data and statistics that's going around here. So for me, um, these are of interest, but they are not nearly as critical as they have been in the past years because they did a lot of manipulation of data in order to get our accountability ratings this so year. Do you have a sense of, is it math is one way and... It, 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 it varied from year to year and from test to test. Uh, yeah, Mr. Hainer. Question of reli uh, reliability from your professional opinion on this. I mean, what you just said to me said, that I feel that this is more political to, to do this and going forward until we get 100% park, I really question fiddling around trying to make uh, an apple fit in an uh, orange skin. Well, I have to say that as we look at the data, there was only there were only one set of results that surprised us as a as a, a curriculum team. I would say the rest of the data was pretty much what we expected. So, in terms of reliability, I guess I would want if I understood better why the one school's data surprised me so much, and that's something we're going to be working on throughout the next couple months. Um, then I would be able to answer that question better. Are, are you able to so, get information to break the questions down to look at the curriculum it's the way you could with any, the MCAS? Um, unfortunately, no. Okay, so until you get that. And, and we will not get that. It's We've very been hard told. to, to right. make that. So that's what I want to say. We, we sort of take this with a grain of salt. It gives us some indication of where we will stand. Remember that the next test will be MCAS 2.0. It will not be PARC. Right. Will we so, be get, able to analyze the right. test or is that still going to be actually, verboten? Let's wait All right. on that, that, future questions. That's to be determined. <laughs> that's, um, yeah, there's so many variables at this point. But actually, it might be helpful to uh, remind the public about what this year was supposed to be, that it was right. sort of an experimental year, right. that we knew that we'd ha we wouldn't have results that would look, that would help us as much, and that we were sort of playing with this. Right, that's exactly and correct. And that's why we decided to hold everything harmless. Yes, that's correct. Can I make one comment, too, that um, it's not as though if you took um, MCAS, you're going to get any better data this year. Right. In part yeah. because the sample it's communities small. was so small. Mm -hmm. What was it, 25%? Yeah. That, that the data there is not that not ca uh, calculating comparables for anything mm. this no. year. So the yeah. state data is not, we still, cannot compare ourselves against the state this but year. But you'd still be able if, if, to look at the questions and stuff and analyze against what your performance, is this something we put with strength in and stuff? Well, they will give you the questions, but you don't know where <coughs> your school stood on the answers to right. those questions. So I don't know if 25% of my kids got it right or 25% of my kids got it wrong. They're not giving us that information. And even, even if you were to, we were to have chosen MCAS, is I, that your question? I guess what I, I've got to ask, what's the value of the test if you're not finding out how your school... <laughs> well, if, you, if we no, remember, this you, was an experimental I thought, I thought year. I thought I understood you that even in the future we okay. won't. Oh, no, in the future, we, okay. the future's oh, yet to be seen. Uh, we want to get into details, but big picture questions, comments. Okay, the big picture in? is this. Uh, you know, uh, the compared to what right. uh, on individual questions is tough because there's error, but the real strength comes from grouping similar questions together. And, and that's sort of the diagnostic that, that if you're doing it well, you're using. You can't do that this year, uh, re regardless of where you are, because even if you have the MCAS, you don't have the compared to what. You don't have reliable statewide sample so you can't see how you're doing an open response vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the state 
uh, or the key content areas that you're worried about. So no, no matter how you're doing it, you're, you're not going to get there. You still have your growth scores. You can take a look at your student growth scores. Uh, they were all calculated similarly. Um, uh, you know, that, that's still a pretty valid measure. And I think the concordance uh, MCAS scores across the park is giving you a pretty reliable sense of how things are going statewide. Because it's based on a statewide sample. And if your numbers move a little bit, yeah, that could be a test effect. If they're moving substantively, there might be something else going right. on. Right. So, you know, there, there are things you can spot, not to the degree that you, you, you would normally see, but it's, you know, worth looking at the data and thinking about for, for a few minutes. Sure. Okay. Dr. Alessandri, big picture type of? I'll ask at the end. Okay. Okay. So there are three components to um, uh, what we call the Progress and Performance Index, which is the PPI that we hear all about. Um, one is achievement or closing the achievement gap. That's the CPI. One is what Mr. Schlickman just alluded to, which is the student growth percentile. And then at the high school level, we have dropout and graduation rates. Um, our schools continue to be um, high performing schools and high performing schools have challenged maintaining high growth. Um, our schools continue to have high percentile rankings and this is one of the first times we're going to show you what that is across the board. So you can see that sometimes a school will have not a, C a PPI that didn't hit the target but they're in a very high percentile. So I wanted to take a look at that mm -hmm. and then I, I guess we said this is the first year for a major shift in the testing format. Um, so this is easier seen if you have it in front of you than it is. <laughs> However, the visual I want to make here is that the yellows are um, things that are below the targets. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the first set of yellows that you see there are for school accountability and assistance level. And um, you will see which schools are level one. Those are white. And then in what years each school were level two. So, for example, Bishop was a level one in 2013, 2014. It became a level two school in 2015, which was the first year it had a sufficient number of students to have um, its uh, subgroups counted. And then it was a uh, level two in 2016. Mm -hmm. um, then you'll n notice the next set of data is about the cumulative PPI and the target for schools to be level one is 75. Um, you'll, this is for all students. You'll see that in, um, this is from 2013 to 2016, and you'll see that in 2016, um, we had two schools that for all students were below the 75 target, mm -hmm. um, one being Dallin and the second one being Thompson. And then the third set of data that you see here is cumulative PPI for our high need students. Um, and the ones that are yellow um, are the ones that are below the 75 PPI target. Um, and then the last set of data is data that we have not um, shared uh, regularly and that and not because we were holding it back but just because it was not part of the presentation. But we wanted to include it this year, which is the school percentile within school type. So, for example, Bishop has a 71 PPI for its high need students and 100 P, um, PPI for its all students, and, but you'll see that it's in the 94th percentile. So even though it's not making the 75 PPI, it's mm -hmm. ranked very high compared to other um, mm -hmm. comparable schools. So we just kind of wanted to say that um, that's an indicator that the school is doing well and then there's just an area that we need to continue to focus on. Uh, quick question? Yeah. Yeah, Mr. Henry. Look down below where the Audison and uh, the high school were both level one schools listed last year, and now they're level two. If you go over to the third column, I'm misunderstanding it. They both have the, ast the single asterisk and saying uh, that they're uh, not going to be harmed by, by the park. Now, I know they didn't take the park. I don't know why they're listed in this. Uh, well, the, the, actually, Audison did take the park. So if they were held harmless under park, uh, why did they? Level. Okay, why did they and I'm gonna I'm gonna get to that. Can, oh, sorry. Can, can I ask if, if you can? Uh, uh, great. Okay. You, it's the end of column four. Mm -hmm. That's preview of coming attractions. So here we go. Um, this is the um, chart that you're used to seeing that shows you for each of the schools and for the district. Um, for 2014, 2015, and 2016, and you'll notice that, as Mr. Hainer just alluded to, there are asterisks by um, some of the schools. Dallin had um, um, 
a 71 uh, PPI for its high need students, normally that would mean that that school would have moved down to level two. But because we decided to take the park this year, they were held harmless, so they remained at level one. Audison, on the other hand, had a 73 PPI for its, um, uh, sorry, 61 PPI for its high need students and a 73 PPI for all of its students. And they actually weren't held harmless, and that is because you could be held harmless for your scores, but you could not be held harmless for your participation rates. And this is something that we've talked about prior. So in order to be a level one school, you must have 95% of all of your students and 95% of your subgroups that have 20 or more students um, participate in the test. When you have a very small subgroup, such as special education, if one or two students, usually two, would, would pop you over, you can fall below that 95% threshold and that means that the highest level that you can be is level two. We have um, submitted as we have had to do the last two years for the high school submitted a, an appeal for Audison um, because we felt that the two students that were not counted in our participation rate um, they're not taking the test was out of our control and I'm waiting from the Department of Education to rule on that. Um, also for the high school even though they have sufficient PPI at both the high needs and the all PPI to qualify for this uh, level one, they also had a number of students who have been who were hospitalized either at the time of testing or um, just prior to the time of testing. And so that caused one of their subgroups to fall below the 95% percentile, uh, percentile threshold. And so I also have an appeal into the Department of Education because we felt that that was beyond our control. Thank you. Does that explain? Excellent. Mr. Sickman. Yeah, I know for the Audison it was 95% participation for your ELA and math and 94% on science, mm -hmm. which is only in two grades. So that, one, one, uh, oh, eight. for you it's one grade. One grade, yeah. right. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, pardon me, you I'm thinking five of all eights. we're a five through eight yeah. system. So it's only one grade, so that it's a third of the population is generating the denominator for your numerator. So that's really a sensitive thing for such a small subgroup. So mm -hmm. it, it does seem unfair uh, to knock the school down a level based on uh, on one test and one grade. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it is. Okay. okay. Yes, Dr. Osnan. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Two questions. One. So was our not the subgroup, but what was our um, overall participation for Audison and for AHS? I mean, for the uh, um, all Mr. The Schlickman, I believe just said 95 percent. I was okay. That was for the SPED, but for everybody else, the participation rate would have been um, for all students. Participation rate was 98, 98 for ELA and math, 97 for science. Uh, for the high need subgroup, it would have been 96, 96, 95 for science. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, and yeah. Then the other thing is, I think there's a typo on um, brackets level on that chart. Mm -hmm. No brackets um, level. I don't think oh, I'm sorry. They should have been level one. Yes. Yes. Thank you. I didn't catch that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for pointing that out. Yes, Ms. Um, so, uh, I think that really. The thing that disturbs me the most is that our PPI level at the high school has gone down at least seven points a year. And that's disturbing. So we went from 90 to 83 to 79, right? So we had a seven number drop, then we had four drop. Like we are, I mean, 79 is nothing to be proud of. So that is really concerning to me. The trend there is that our PPI we started pretty high, mm -hmm. and we are not looking very good. Well, no. Same with Audison. No, well, no, that's it's not, quite, it's not quite true. What happened was, is our PPIs uh, t uh, for 2013, 2015, and 2016 were in the 70s. It was 71 in 2013, 71 in 2016. Yeah, but, I, but, but in terms of the annual PPI. Yeah, that's what this now, is. All no, no, that's the cumulative, okay? 
And what happens is in 2014, we had 104 points. And this is weighted. So on the year you get it, that 104 is worth 40% of your score. The subsequent year, it's the, the 104 is worth 30%. This year is worth 20%, and that's going to drop to 10% of your overall. And it's being averaged in with a 71, 71, and a 75. Uh, and because of the weight of that 104 is declining, that's what's causing the score to uh, the the uh, the cumulative score, which is a cumulative based on four years, to decline. So okay, so this this number reflects a three-year average. It's a four-year okay. average. Four it's year a four-year average. rated average. Rated. Forty percent the most recent year, thirty yep. of the previous, twenty of the previous, and ten for the fourth year out. Are you then saying that? Ms. Stark's point about um, that we seem to be declining isn't quite right? No, or it isn't it quite right. We, we had a spike in 2014, and if you look at 13, 15, and 16, they're pretty consistent in, in the 70s. So then rather than declining, we just had a one-year spike? We had a one-year spike. The other three years were pretty consistent. When I come back to present the MCAS and PARC results, I will make sure that I show you what the annual PPI is so you mm -hmm. can take a look at that. Okay. But this and, is the cumulative and, and the issue PPI. was is we had a whole bunch of extra credit points in 2014 because that was just a, a really great year for us. Cutting back yeah. on the students at the failing and increasing the yeah, students yeah, yeah, at yeah, the yeah. advanced. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Is yeah. this your chart yeah. that you've created, or is this from Desi? No, I, I created this. Okay. What, I'm what I'm concerned with is when a parent or somebody goes to Desi and looks at these things, without your knowledge, right. Paul, oh. I don't have it, 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 it becomes it, people make quantum leaps, and it's very it's it's high level math to to really look at this and and, and give it true value and not look at this and see what Ms. Stax just saw, drop drop drop. And uh, they're not necessarily clear in themselves, but I'm not knocking you. I just want no, no, no. I understand. I, it's just that the um, the the accountability rating is based on a cumulative PPI, not your annual PPI. Right. Um, uh, p folks at home, if they're sh so mm -hmm. inclined, can actually go and see the annual PPI. All the data is out on the <laughs> Department of Education website, and it's available to everyone. But I will bring you a chart back that shows annual PPI over time for the next time. Thank you. Great. Um, oh, yeah, sorry, Mr. Cardin. Oh. Maybe you're going to get to this, but is the, is the Dallin uh, drop noticeable? Is that the one thing you were talking about? That's that the one school that I was surprised at the results. Yeah. Um, so our overall trend in the data reflecting progress and closing the achievement gap at the elementary school levels where students and, and scheduling and staffing allow for consistent intervention services and coaching, we're seeing a positive trend in the PPI for high need students because that's you know, definitely the one that we wanna take a look at. Um, at the secondary level, and, that, and that's why I wanna go back and, and show you the actual data because we really feel that, and if you notice this from the cumulative PPI for high need students at the high school level uh, was actually higher than the cumulative PPI for all students. And so we feel that at the high school level, that's where we get the most consistent scheduling of interventions for high need students because they can put it in their schedule, it's blocked out, it doesn't get taken away unless there's some kind of um, assembly or something as um, Ms. Higgins, I sure will, will, just, will uh, agree with me, is that at the elementary school level, it is extraordinarily difficult to get students all the interventions that they need. It's also difficult at the middle school, but even they have blocks of time in their day. At the elementary school, um, it is very, very difficult to get all the interventions that we might wanna give to a student that's a high need student. Um, so these are the individual schools and uh, the reasons um, behind uh, their results. So um, Bishop, uh, again, the um, reason that they're a level two school is they're high need students. If you remember, their, their um, cumulative PPI was 71. Um, we saw an impro improvement in closing the achievement gap and they met their uh, growth, but they had no bonus for failing or advanced. Um, Mr. Cardin just asked about Dallin. I'm gonna get to Dallin in a minute, but just because I happen to know this off the top of my head, Dallin had two students two that were not proficient in one of the grade levels. Mm -hmm. If you want to get, you have to get 10% of your students out of failing in order to get a bonus. When you have two students, to get 10% of that is it's pretty, hard. it's very tough, okay? So 
oftentimes when we see that schools are not getting their bonus, it's not because they're not doing a good job. It's because to get that 10% bonus, you really have to, you know, have a, a mm -hmm. major effort. Um, that, so that's English language arts and math. We, um, again, didn't see a bonus, but we saw a good CPI and SGP. Um, we are piloting a piece of software called iReady for literacy to improve um, the information that we get around comprehensive skills development at the, um, at the fourth and fifth grade level at Bishop. And we're working with math and literacy coaches on a regular basis. So those are the things that we'll be doing um, to try to hopefully bring that 71 to 75 for the next year. Hardy, again, is a level two school because of their high need students. Um, we also saw improvement in closing the achievement gap in their um, uh, growth percentile at ELA, but again, no bonus. Again, very difficult to do. We saw an improvement in their CPI in math. Um, their SGP remained flat. Um, we're going to continue our Title I tutor there. Um, we're going to focus on data analysis will be reflected in changes in instruction, including we'll be piloting a Fontes and Pinnell um, comprehensive assessment, comprehension assessment. So you'll be seeing that we're, um, we're piloting two assessments this year. One is iReady, which is online, and one is Fontes and Pinnell, which is being done manually uh, to provide more uh, progress monitoring for students who are getting interventions. Pierce, again, high need students. Um, they met their target CPI and SGP in ELA, but did not receive bonus points. In math, they met their target CPI and SGP, but no bonus points. Um, we're going to continue our Title I tutor in math there. We're piloting iReady for math to provide better progress monitoring um, for those students. At Thompson, um, the P, uh, cumulative PPI was below the target for both all and high need students. They had a low slowing of the achievement gap, um, <coughs> but they did have um, improved SGP in ELA. They had some improved um, closing of the achievement ga gap in math and some improvement in growth. Again, no bonus. Um, we will continue our Title I tutor in math and ELA, and professional development for grades three through five will focus on high need students. Uh, Stratton, again, it was the high need student group that um, was below the target. We saw improved CPI and improved growth. Again, no bonus. Um, we saw low achievement gap closing in math, um, and so we will be at, we added a Title I tutor for math support, and we'll be piloting Fontes and Pinnell comprehension assessment for ELA. And if we look to Dallin, um, they missed the target in both all students and high needs. Um, there was no um, movement in closing the achievement gap, and they had a low growth. But again, we're talking about a, a school that has very, very high performance, so it's a lot harder to show those things. And they got no bonus in either group. And in math, there was no movement in closing the achievement gap, and they had a low growth. Um, we're increasing the coaching in math and literacy. We're going to focus on data analysis that will be reflected in changes in instruction, including pilot the Fontes Pinnell um, comprehensive assessment, comprehension assessment. And finally, in Audison, all students and high need students um, in both areas, they had a uh, low closing of the achievement gap and um, little or no growth, and they had no bonus. Um, and the same, pretty much the same thing um, exists for math. Um, we're piloting iReady act actually at the middle school for students in the math support classes to improve progress monitoring and intervention, and we have an increased use of data in ELA. So these are the specific actions that we're going to be taking. And those are not the only actions, but these are the areas that the curriculum team felt um, would get the um, most bang for the buck. And now, if you remember, I talked about in this slide right here, that those schools where we're seeing our, our ability to provide consistent intervention services and coaching are showing positive growth and trends in, in our, for our high need students. And if you were to look at um, this detailed chart, you'll see that Pierce met their CPI and their SGP target in ELA, and they met their CPI and their SGP target in math. And that's the school that's probably the easiest to make sure that students consistently get their interventions 
because there's only two teachers in each grade and so it's very it's much easier to work work the scheduling out um dr Alsnampi had a question um i'm wondering if any of the results specifically audison had to do with the fact that they took electronic they took park via electronic testing or that was what i remember mm -hmm. uh, they did take it online mm -hmm. um i can only uh, since i don't really have anything to compare it to because they all took it online i can go back to bishop and if i look at bishop's results compared to they were the only school that took it online at the elementary level and i look at the other schools i see no difference in their results nor when we did the um uh, surveys for students and, and teachers we saw students you know really saying that, that they were comfortable with it um, a little bit less in third grade in terms of doing it online than the fourth and fifth grade um, one of the things that we've done this year is to um, increase the amount of time that students have access to um, what we call kid blog so that they get more comfortable responding to online questions and that's because all fourth graders will be taking the test online this year across the district um, and so uh, there was t the teachers at the bishop felt that their fourth and fifth grade students felt the most comfortable because they had spent a lot of time um, composing um, essays and, and short answer questions using kid blogs. So we, we've expanded that across the district this year. So in terms of Audison, I really don't have anything to compare it to. I don't have a sort of control right. group. So yes, Mr. Thielen. So could you just talk a little bit about the um discussions you might have had with teachers and principals about the results, how you impact the results, and whether or not they're, they're significant enough to change instruction or have conversations about changing instruction, or they're not, or what do you think? I actually said at the beginning that I don't think, I think that we need to look at this, we need to think about it, we need to look at others. So for example, for Dallin, I wanna compare those results against um, writing samples that we're doing now in the fall. So to look at kids that may not have scored well in literacy and look at their writing samples that we're getting for them, look at their DRE scores, look at the math assessments that we're doing to see whether I think that, um, you know, we really t sold people that we were trying out the test. Yep. And there's a ver there was a varying response from school to school in test prep. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we really didn't want people to prepare too much. So I think that um, they took us at our word. They tested the test. They, mm -hmm. they made sure the kids were comfortable with it. We did not have any reports of any students actually across the district being uncomfortable. But I've, I feel like that because of the way we mm -hmm. approached it, that it's really hard to really take it with less than a grain of salt. Yeah. I feel like we it gives us an indicator. We're going to look at other measures to see whether this is something we should be concerned about or not concerned about, mm -hmm. but we've also put things in place to get, provide us with more data. So it's just, it's maybe a year from now this kind of data might change, cause you to change practice. Yes, but right now I would say no. Got it, thank you. Mr. Hainer. You included Dallin in, the, in this chart here because of the PPI numbers that came out? Yes, b okay. they were held harmless, so that's why. Well, I, I and you, if, if they weren't held harmless and those numbers came out that way, they would have been a level two. That's correct. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Slippen. I know there's a decision point coming up now uh, as to go to uh, paper or electronic for the rest of the district. Uh, what's been the thinking? Um, we have chosen to have all of, well, Bishop did it all online last year, and they will continue to do so. Pierce, because it's a small school and it's easy to support with the number of tech support people we have, will also be taking it online. Audison took it online. They'll continue to take it online. And fourth graders across the district will take it online. Um, that's what the state expectation was, and so we feel like we're prepared to meet that expectation. Um, I think we'll, we'll see how the tech support goes this year. Mm -hmm. um, the state is asking for only fifth grade to be added next year. I mean, once we add fourth and fifth grade, I, actually, to be honest, I have principals that are like, do it all online. Mm -hmm. um, teachers uh, at, at Bishop, when we got the new iReady assessment, they were like, as long as it's online, I'm signing up. Um, they just really felt like the online um, handling of the paperwork and the testing and everything was much much smoother and we had a number of issues with you know what were you supposed to send back what weren't you supposed to send back that we would be a lot better off across the district without a lot of paper 
I know, the, just just as a point that and it sort of surprised me there was a, a widespread opinion upon our principles and law that we should do everything online this year uh, we have the technical capacity in terms of the servers uh, and it, it's giving everybody a head start towards it so uh, it, it was a bit of a surprise for me to see that kind of a groundswell in it but it makes a lot of sense and I think we would have done that. We have the bandwidth. We have the devices. That's not the issue. The issue is that we want to put tech support people in each building. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, for the first time that people are doing the mm -hmm. testing, and we just don't have enough people to go around. But so that's going to be an issue for yeah, the budget. The budget. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that does it. We've got a bunch of part-time people we can deploy. Right. Yeah, I, one of the feedbacks I've heard is that some really valuable people were sort of put in the role of tech support because we, we could use them, but they, they could be doing other things <laughs> and should. Yeah. So um, if we look at other assistance plans, we now have district-wide elementary um, literacy and math websites with exemplar videos that are made available for all teachers. Mm -hmm. um, this includes models of data analysis which impact instruction. So we're making a video of one of our literacy coaches um, doing a DRA score with a student and then talking about how you can break down pieces of that DRA score to help instruction in the classroom. Um, we also have um, teachers that are um, making videos about different bends in Lucy Calkins and a teacher can actually watch it and then do the bend the next day. So um, we're going to deepen our coaching model and try to increase our consistency and you're going to find as Dr. Bode just alluded to that our budget requests for 2017-2018 um, at least in the curriculum director's opinion, um, we'll focus on items necessary to provide consistent support for high-need students and their teachers across the district. Uh, other questions? Oh, I, have, I have one more question. Um, so in the, um, the plans, there seems to be a wide variety of, 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 of things that we're planning to mm -hmm. do depending on the school and I'm just wondering why in certain cases do we do I ready for literacy but not for math and you know what's the decision point there is it just based on the numbers or is there some other uh, well some in some cases it's based on what we saw in the results mm -hmm. um, but we're piloting I ready at two schools to try to decide whether it's giving us the kind of information mm -hmm. that we really want it's not expensive but it's not cheap Right. You know, okay. And so we want to make sure that the data that we're getting from it, mm -hmm. um, it's an adaptive test. So if a student starts the test and they're doing really, really well, then the questions get harder. Mm -hmm. If the student starts the test and they're having difficulty, then the questions will get a little bit easier. Um, so you can test and get a really good snapshot of a student in a much shorter amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, but we want to make sure that it is going to get us the kind of information mm -hmm. that is helpful to um, improve instruction. Because if it's not, then it doesn't make any difference if it costs 10 cents. You right, know, right. If it does, then right. it's, it's right. worth the investment. Okay. Good, thanks. Uh, Dr. Asinavi. Mm -hmm. I had two questions. First, um, these pilots, will we get to hear the results of them sometime later in the year or maybe early next year? Um, yeah, I would say sometime in the middle of the spring because we need to do two or three testing cycles, so we won't have that those results until sometime in, in the springtime. Okay, and then... Well, one thing I... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Yes. Um, the, I was going to loop back to the question I had at the start, which was, if I understood correctly, Dr. Chesson said that we didn't... The teachers don't get the results of the questions? They don't get, res they don't get what's called item analysis, so they don't find out how their students did on a specific question. However, they do, for, for example, for our literacy, they get to find out where their students stood on a group of questions that would be regarding an informational text, a group of questions that would be on literary analysis, and a group of questions that would be on vocabulary. That's the closest thing we're going to get towards. I guess I'm, I just got my, um, my child's part thing in the mail today, so mm -hmm. I just glanced at it. Um, but it had results for questions which were released. I mean, it had the answer that she had put, which was not the correct answer on some of them. Hmm. Um, was that the science test? No. Maybe it was, actually. Yeah. I was, was going to say, the same science, yeah, science, science was right, right, in right. class, and they released, yeah. and they released right. that okay. information. Okay, now I, I was like, I didn't yeah. see that. So I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. No. Okay, never Good. mind. Yeah. My mistake. 
Well, yes, Dr. Buddy. Uh, well, we're doing the iReady, which is an adaptive test. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that um, I've come to understand is that the new MCAS 2.0 will not be adaptive. It's going mm -hmm. to be a fixed. It's going to be a fixed form test. Mm -hmm. So, but we still want to do the the iReady in terms of having another touch point for mm -hmm. just seeing what the progress students are making, particularly the students that we are we, we really wanted to monitor. Mm -hmm. Do we have any more information about NCAS 2.0 in terms of whether it be timed or? It's untimed. It's going to be untimed. untimed. Going to be untimed. Mm -hmm. We know that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. Okay. I think uh, any more questions, comments? And so, uh, superintendent's report. Mm -hmm. All right. A um, number of things, and some of them are very much related uh, to each other. Let me start with, uh, the, the, these were put in an uh, order before we, thinking about and which makes more sense to be talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, October 19th is the day of the special town meeting. Mm -hmm. And while the capacity to uh, borrow money for a Thompson edition uh, was, was approved okay. in June, we still have to go before a town meeting and ask for appropriation. Now, what we decided at the School Enrollment Task Force last year was to make that decision this year after uh, looking at enrollment to Thompson. And, and basically, it really came down to a, a one litmus test. You know, what was the projection for the enrollment this year? And would we meet that ex expectation, or would we not or exceed it? And that the the enrollment projection, I think, was 448, and we have exceeded it at 465. So, I mean, that alone was the, the information the School Enrollment, enrollment Task Force wanted to know in order to um, make their recommendation that we go ahead with the Thompson edition. When you look into the Dr. McKibben's August forecast, which is just using our summer numbers, and you look out the next 10 years or more, in fact, it's a 15 year projection now, Thompson for the foreseeable future are going to have kindergarten class sizes around 80 or more. And that's going to be for kindergartens. So as we, as we, as that, that group of four keeps moving through the school, we're going to need additional classrooms. Right now our fifth grade, there is two and our, and so, and the last year's was two, so as that two moves out and four moves in, you can see what the effect is going to be. So that is going, the recommendation had been to meet at the School Enrollment Task Force to go forward with the Thompson edition. They have endorsed that recommendation, which will be uh, presented by Mr. Chapelain at the uh, 19th meeting. Another Warren article that was um, was put in as a placeholder was the warrant article for modulars at um, Odyssey next year. And we've discussed uh, some of my reasoning, and actually it's not even just my reasoning, it's the, it was the reasoning of the administrators and um, other people at Odyssey in terms of what to do next year. Clearly the school is tight, very tight. And where they really see it at Odyssey is in the corridors, you know, in the cafeteria. Um, we, this, this, particular, this particular summer, we, or I should, let me back up it even a little further. The school committee supported adding a half cluster to Odyssey this year. So we're gonna have three full clusters and a half cluster at each level. So we had to do a lot of construction this summer to make this work. And there were a lot of people that had to move, programs move. Uh, it was actually quite, quite significant amount of moving that occurred at the school. In order to be able to accommodate the increased enrollment this year. So the bottom line of this is that while we know that it's still going to be tight next year and we're expecting another 40 students dispersed over the three grades, um, it didn't make sense to add modulars next year. Doesn't mean that Audison couldn't use modulars, but it's, it would be only for one year. 
if we were not looking at Gibbs, this is the this next year would be the beginning of starting to add modular classrooms until we had eight or ten modulars at Audison over the next couple of years to deal with enrollment growth. But the feeling of administration was that given all the work that went into the summer to to make sure it would work in terms of space with very high utilization. Some rooms are utilized 100% of the day. Um, you know, some, I don't think any of them are pretty much much under 85%, which is an MSBA requirement in their projections. So at any rate, you've got high, we're using high utilization. We did a massive amount of construction a schedule was created that, that actually worked quite well this fall. And an additional issue about next year is that if any modulus we put on the upper parking lot would reduce parking. Mm -hmm. And that is a big problem. As we've increased the number of staffing there to meet enrollment growth, the, the crunch for parking has only gotten worse. So if we put even a modular up there, we'd probably reduce a modular or two, we'd probably reduce the parking by half. So there was a lot of reasons why, you know, the decision was made uh, to not go forward, including one other, and that is when you put a modular at a school, and we saw this at Thompson, it takes a lot of time on the part of administration. It would take a lot of time just in terms of the physically, uh, you know, having it all work, but then it would mean you have to again adjust, move people into the modular mm -hmm. and would have this domino effect in the rest of the school. They would rather put the time and energy into planning for Gibbs rather than, you know, adjusting the schedule and everything one more time for one year. Mm -hmm. So I, I wanted to say this because I think a lot of people are confused because, and in fact, I've had some parents say, well, you thought, you said that we really need a lot of modulars next year. We didn't need eight or ten next year, but we certainly need, could have used, you know, two or four, uh, depending on what, how you did the programming. But um, we made a decision as a town to go forward with Gibbs, and I think that in the interest of cost and all these other reasons I've given, we will adjust next year, make it work and uh, put our time and energy into all the planning for Gibbs. Mm -hmm. And so that article will, will have no action on it at town meeting. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody wants to comment or go on before I... Yes, uh, Mr. Dillon. So the articles at town meeting, the impact of schools are just... Two and just Thompson. Thompson. Uh, just Thompson, Thompson. that's it. Thompson. Thompson. And, and, yeah, Thompson. Then, no action, and, uh, no, and no. then that's it. Thompson. The last article has to do with uh, medic marijuana dispensaries in terms of how many feet away from a school they can be. It doesn't really... There's also a zoning article that may dominate for two nights. No, I'm, I'm aware of that. Yeah. School-wide, school yeah, yeah, but school -wide. the school committee is not involved question. in any other... Mm. Yeah. No. No. That's right. Yeah. That's, 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 that's it. it. That's, that's it. it. Yep. Thank Strainer. you. Drainer, yes. With regard to Hardy, uh, the, the need for the extra space and things of that nature. There was some talk uh, at the enrollment task force meeting. It, it, we didn't, there was no decision and there wasn't much talk. But to take action, how, the space needs there are going to happen next September, am I correct? We need one more classroom next year. So in order to get that, unless somebody magically finds something, we're gonna have to go to the town for some money or take it out of our own our own coffers. Mm -hmm. How do you see, I mean, you, you put down in your report it needs more study, but we're in a time crunch to have everything in place for September next year. That's all I'm my concern about. Um, the principal and I have a plan A and a plan B to deal with the one classroom for next year. But beyond that, we have to have modulars classrooms there. And I would recommend as soon as possible we start talking about it in enrollment task force. Right. Could you tell us a plan about what, um, when things would need to be studied, when, you know, we'd need to go to town meeting for mm -hmm. various things? I, I think that we would need to begin the planning this year for sure because it's just the way the calendar works. We're, uh, the director of facilities and I have been looking at ways that 
what would be the best thing to do in terms of acquiring modulars. Mm -hmm. But the lead time on that, you know, we would, we'd probably want to be going out looking for modulars next fall. <laughs> so you just keep backing these things up. And, and then there's the, the issue of cost. Um, perhaps what we might want to do is by spring town meeting being able to Make a, make a request for that. So we need yeah. to really be thinking seriously about it right now because the warrant is going to be published in two months. Right. And it's closed. I mean, the time crunch is real short. So, I, I mean. Mm -hmm. We'll put a placeholder in. Yeah, for well, sure. Well, not only that, but we need, to, mm -hmm. we need, we've done a good job getting the enrollment task force mm -hmm. uh, on board for everything, our request. So it, it, Dr. Alessandri. Can we shift any of the modulars that are at Stratton anywhere once they're done? That's possible. We've, you know, we've always thought about that as a possibility. It's, it's whatever the, the cost would be. It's possible to do that, yes. I'm just thinking then there's no headway for building them or... or but it's not clear that that's the most cost-effective way to do it. No, and I'm, in fact, I'm just saying it, it gets rid of some of the time, you know, some of the at least they're built. At least they're still, here. You still got to build here. them up and right, you know right, attach them and all they're that. They're here, but, but at least they're here. We right. still they're just have to move them. But right. we still need the money, and the money yeah. aspect is is the part of the timeline. Okay, so clarification: um, there is a discussion about modulars only, not necessarily building onto Hardy. Mm -hmm. um, we'll do the the discussion has to happen this year to potentially be put on the the spring ballot for town meeting right but one of the w yes uh, one of the issues with hardy is that you know there's not much space there mm -hmm. and y you could be in a situation at hardy just like we are at thompson where you have modular classrooms but you you also want to have construction going so the placement of those modulars will be important mm -hmm. and frankly the number Mm -hmm. because it's just not that much space. So it's not as simple or straightforward as one might think it would be. So is there, <laughs> can you tell us the timing about whether we're going to look at the idea of building permanently? I mean, those decisions are far away, but is there sort of a timeline for when we'll be exploring that issue? Well, if you had a chance to take a look at the August McKibben numbers, the, um, the, there's, there is a leveling off much faster at Hardy in terms of numbers, assuming <laughs> Mugar doesn't get failed. You got it. Yes. <laughs> and we don't even really we don't know, know the impact of right, that either right. and when it would hit. So I, that's something that the town manager is, is going to be looking at and coming back to the school enrollment task force to talk more about. But there are a lot of ifs at Hardy that are, are a little bit more nuanced mm. than they were, say, at at Thompson. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. But I th but I think the important message for particularly parents who are hearing this tonight, mm -hmm. that it is definitely on our radar screen. Mm -hmm. We are definitely going to study it um, and uh, make plans to make this work for the school. Yeah. What I've heard from parents is I think they just want to know that it's being studied, even mm -hmm. though they understand that the decisions may not be made mm -hmm. yet, mm -hmm. but that we have explored various plans and have an idea of. Mm -hmm. Mr. Carton. Yeah, I, I thought I heard at the meeting that there, the next step, one of the next steps would be to draft the RFP with the facilities department to, to do that study. Is, is, is it's been that, done. Okay. It's been done and if, um, just to see, because there's, there's so many options. One is, it, as you mentioned, is Stratton. There's certainly the issue of whether Thompson would be moved. But then there's also another option um, of whether another company would give us a better price. Mm -hmm. And then there's the option of should we buy it and then transport it from Florida or Georgia here and then have it installed with yet a separate company. So the, the news is that they're assuming the task force at the next meeting approves moving ahead with the study mm -hmm. then either us or the finance committee or somebody will fund a study to to more um, outline more better outline the, the possible solutions for Hardy. 
Yes, I think correct? we're going to need. I think we're going to need a study. We, we certainly HMFH gave us a, a, a fairly good roadmap of options there. Um, the, but if, if in fact we go out the number of years, and assuming that Hardy needs four classrooms per grade, then we're going to need three classrooms. And what's the best way to put three yeah. classrooms on that yes. building? All right. Um, I think we did the update. Um, the enrollment numbers. We don't have a new. You don't document. have a new one yet, um, but I will get that to you as soon as we're able to get that. It's we're now past October one, so whatever the number snapshot was, those are all being mm -hmm. looked at right now. But I will get you the latest one. From what I understand, uh, from just a conversation with our data people, that really hasn't changed that much. It's minor changes, but the overall is that. We are approaching 5,500, and as, you know, specifically on September 22nd, we had 5,467 students. That is, represents a 4% increase over last year. I think we're going to be at 4% for sure. It's actually 4.1%. Dr. McKibben had us at 4.5%, so I think some of this, but we'll, well, I'll be able to tell you better the next time we meet where we stand. All right, and then um, Gibbs. timeline for Gibbs. Um, right now, there's not much to report. Uh, the, the architects are working on the design. Um, I'm certainly thinking about what the schedule would be separate and apart from the physical building. What are we going to be doing for all the other parts of it in terms of um, what's the curriculum? How is it going to be scheduled? Um, busing issues, personnel issues. There's a lot of things that are going to go into this. And one of the things that's actually we're going to talk about tomorrow at an admin meeting is talk a little bit about timelines in terms of what, when we need to move forward mm -hmm. with different committees and so forth. And we're going to have a parent advisory committee. Mm -hmm. But right now, there's no need for one because there's no decisions or feedback to be had. So I think that um, we'll be reaching out to people probably in the next month or two to put that kind of committee together. That will be helpful during the next uh, next phase of the project. Mr. Cardin. Um, so I'm, I'm surprised at the number of people that ask me, so what's going on with the Gibbs? What's been decided? I, I mean, there's been a, a few communications, you know, inviting people to that meeting and, and things like that. But there are even some teachers that are saying, oh, it's not opening until 2019. And mm -hmm. so there, there seems to be a lot of confusion uh, about what's going on. So at some point, you know, maybe when you open these, this new committee up, if there was just a very short clear, mm -hmm. the plan is to do this. We're hoping to open it fall 2018, barring any, you know, mm -hmm. construction issues. Um, it'll be f for sixth grade. These committees will be working on programming it. A very clear, short communication mm -hmm. might help c clear up some of the confusion that still seems to be around. Okay, uh, that's, that's good advice. One of the things the committee should know, because I think the public would like to know too, is that um, there are a lot of, as you know, there's been a lot of discussion about Gibbs tenants, and one of the things that I have been, meet, I have been meeting with those tenants and working with the director of facilities to how we're going to accommodate their programs next summer in summer. our schools. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're, and in fact, today I had a meeting about about this very topic with our new director of recreation because we house right now two programs at Gibbs uh, for the recreation department. One of which is a, a significant money raise, um, fun, uh, um, I should say. Revenue. To revenue, revenue, revenue right, right, exactly right. Strong revenue source for the, for the for parks and recs, <clears throat> which is an enterprise system. So it's very important that they, you know, have this income. So. We're working on that. Mm -hmm. Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, I just wanted to be sure that we're also thinking about, um, as, as we go forward with the Gibbs, about the needs of our populations, which are going to have more difficulty with the multiple transitions and, and working that into planning, mm -hmm. um, you know, especially if it involves things like do the spaces need to be similar in both Audison and Gibbs and you know right anything that would affect the physical space that that would be being built in at this point mm -hmm. I just those are the kids that I'm the most concerned about as we go forward with this plan mm -hmm. 
I think you're right. And I th we've done more work on transitions, but clearly we even need to do more when you have such a, a short time in one building. People have been talking about that, but then there's talking about understanding how to do something about it, and then it's getting down to what is that going to look like, right. and that's what the, the work will be for sure. Mr. Hainer. For those that are interested in the community that uh, about the construction aspect of the Gibbs, I'd invite them to the Permantown Building Committee mm -hmm. meetings. Uh, it's a standard item on the agenda, and it, it's in detail of the current aspect of the construction. Uh, they're very good about that, so, mm -hmm. and it's an open meeting. Anyone is welcome to come. That's the construction aspect. Uh, Mr. Cole is the uh, chair, and he defers immediately. Any educational questions, sends them right up to Dr. Bodie. Dr. Bodie, do you want to talk about the two meetings that were held, uh, one with teachers and one with uh, parents, and mm -hmm. uh, about mm -hmm. sort of Gibbs visioning? We had two meetings. Gibbs visioning meetings, mm -hmm. one with teachers and one with parents. Both were well attended. Um, it was a voluntary meeting for teachers, and we had about 30, 35 to 40 teachers attend, all grade levels, in fact. Um, and then also the same thing for parents. Uh, and this, both sessions were facilitated by the educational planner who has been working with Fine Gold. In fact, he works with other districts and probably will work with us as we move forward with the high school as well. His name is um, David Stephen. So we have um, summary notes from both of those meetings, and both of them are now on the website. I'm pretty sure. I know that I know that for sure the teacher one is. I'm, I'm almost positive we put the um, the parent one on this week. Um, we have a under facilities. We have yeah. You want to check? Yeah, we have that. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm pretty sure we did. Cause we we just got we got the summary. Um, we're we're going to create a a dedicated site to Gibbs under facilities, as we will also with the high school project. Right. Um, I think it's going to be, in fact, with the high school, it's going to be really important to do that, and I will encourage people to even, I think we'll even have some kind of a newsletter type of um, uh, part with that, but that that's yet to, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves on that one. Yeah, I, I just urge um, that we have a sort of a clear, quick link or button that we can go into. You know what, I get can't. get a sense of, of what's happening with Gibbs and what's happening at the high school. You know what I can do, and, and this might actually uh, help with the parents who talked to Mr. Cardin, and that is maybe send out an email to all parents mm -hmm. of the elementary schools, for that matter, middle school too, and tell them, remind them when we're planning to open Gibbs and give them a link to this yeah. information. Yeah. yeah, I'll do that, okay. Yeah. And Karen's going to help me remember to do that. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be helpful. And, and I think, I mean, at Mr. Cardin's sort of um, point about having uh, some sort of timeline, say, you know, January through May, we're doing this kind of thing. And, you know, I know that's still being worked out, but I think for both the high school and for Gibbs, it'd be really timeline. helpful. And it could be with a caveat saying it's, it's vague, you know, or it's not vague, but, you know, obviously subject to, to circumstances. But, um, mm -hmm. but then people can sort of follow along. You know, mm -hmm. oh, it's January. We're yeah. probably in this kind of <laughs> right. stage. Right. Yeah. And then alert them where the site is so they can just, any documents we get exactly. is just going to go right on there. And then, of course, there's also the school enrollment task force. Mm -hmm. and, and if you start, if you've ever gone on that, ta you're going to. It's just a list of it's things. It's just so yeah. many right. documents right. Right. That, that the committee has had to consider over the last year. Yeah. Well, changing from buildings, I just have two quick things. One is I want to acknowledge this um, joint press release that went out uh, late this afternoon from Chief Ryan and myself, basically um, alerting parents that about the clowns that are yeah. the, the nationwide, yes, the clowns. The clowns. <laughs> yes. Um, they've been finding that there has been clowns that have been luring kids um, into woods or in, into, uh, and just feeling like they're preying on children. We haven't had any incidents around here. We haven't heard anything, but the fact that it is something that's been growing in and talking about in social media and it's all across the country, we did get an alert this morning, and then as we thought about it during the course of the day, decided to do a joint press release, which was sent to all parents, media, and to uh, all staff. So basically, the issue is that you know if anybody 
seize clowns to call the police. <laughs> yeah. Oh now, that may be problematic <laughs> when we get to Halloween. Inna scary. Inappropriate. Scar songs. Inappropriate, scary. Inappropriate. Except I know tons of kids who walked in Halloween to dress up. Yes. That's no, I don't, I don't want to make light of it, but it's, you know, it's, it's unfortunate these things had to be said, but um, it's really, you're absolutely right. It's really the inappropriate, if anything, that just doesn't look right. It's better to be, you know, safe on this than not. So that's why we decided to put out joint press release. And then one other. Um, Dr. Dr. Allison, if he has oh. so quick. Um, I had heard of some students who were very concerned, I mean, to the point where they were fearful and staying up late at night. Would, they, would it be appropriate for them to see their guidance counselor <coughs> or to, yes. to get some help? Yes. Or, okay. If, they, if, if, if there's if, any, if, if a student has fear about this or anything, and, and they should definitely talk to a social worker in their school. Uh, or the guidance counselor. Okay, they would mm -hmm. get the guidance counselor could get them out. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. And at the middle school, all of our our guidance counselors are social right. or, okay. or, or school adjustment counselors. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. I also just want to take this opportunity to um, uh, remind people that the that um, we have a save a date for the AYCC gala event again this year. It's going to be on Thursday, November seventeenth at 7 p.m. Now, that is a school committee meeting. School committee meeting. Talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, excuse um, me. I've got to say, with all our concerns about not hitting th certain things, I think we've managed to have almost an event every single school committee meeting. <laughs> this Since wasn't the schools this time. <laughs> the, yeah. Well, we there's, need no, a no, there is, calendar there is a that people take serious. There's a school mm -hmm. for So, and the guest speaker is David Axelrod. Wow. Okay, so so we do want to raise this question about whether we want to shift our school committee meeting at that point, um, because we also have a conflict with high school conferences, which is a conflict potentially for some parents, but also for parking. Yep. And so we do want to bring, I'm not sure what the appropriate time to bring that up is, but. Probably under liaison reports. And liaison reports. reports. No, future let's, agenda. Well, okay, let's bring it up then. Our great, awesome. All right, and that, that's my report. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so now we are on to consent agenda. <clears throat> All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Warrant for approval, warrant number 17047, dated 922-2016, total warrant amount 777970 cents. Approval of minutes, ASC regular minutes, September 22nd, 2016. Approval of AHS trip, AHS foreign exchange trip, um, to be determined. Originally, this is the point that, that, Dr. Hainer, that Mr. Yeah. Hainer brought up. Uh, originally approved 10-22-2015. Uh, the clarification on that is that we are approving the tr each trip each year even though maybe the first trip was approved in a previous period. Approval of AHS trip, Cape Town, South Africa, February 16th to, the, um, to 28th, 2017. Approval of AHS trip, London and Environs, April 13th, 2017. Approval of AHS trip, Poland and Prague, June of 2017. So moved. Uh, wait, we have probably have an abstention, yes, right? Yes, 22nd, I gotta take that so, up. Gotta so yeah, so let's take out the... Um, Just abstain. The minutes. You don't. You don't need to be present to vote the minutes. To approve the minutes. But on, on the minutes side, just want to note there's a slight correction that I forwarded to. Uh, Are we? Uh, Ms. Fitzgerald on the minutes. Okay. So that I'd like to uh, ask that, that they be uh, approved as. As amended. Do, are we pulling it out from the consent agenda, though, or are we just we're no, keeping I it in there? No, it's just a and, uh, uh, so, so the clarification minor is Minor error. Right, okay, so that there is a, as amended, the minutes as amended. Oh, we can um, vote if we're not there. I didn't realize that. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I didn't realize that either. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Mm. Okay, uh, it's unanimous for me, too. Okay, so um, the next item, um, just want to tell you what's going on here. Um, uh, Ms. Fitzgerald's uh, idea was to actually have maybe a standing item 
uh, for policy to review. Uh, she said it's much easier to sort in Novus if she can just sort it rather than having to figure out where the policy is hidden. Mm -hmm. She can just pull it out and sort it by that. So even though if today we have no policy to review, it's not a bad thing to sort of have it on. Uh, it, it may be sort of always here, right? And then you can just pull it up and some days you won't have anything and some days you will. Just, yes, Mr. Hainer. Just for clarification going forward. So in the subcommittee meeting of policy procedures, if we bring forward something for first review, I tell you and it will show up there. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Good. Good. Yes, Dr. Ellison. Can Anderson. I suggest we write none if there weren't any? Yeah. yeah. I think there was an expectation that there was going to yeah. be something, okay. and then we found out later on that there wasn't anything. Um, but okay, so we'll we'll just we'll keep it as a standing item and write none or write something. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, uh, subcommittee committee and liaison reports and announcements. Budget. Dr. Ellison. Budget. Anderson. We'll be sending out a doodle in hopes to meet in the next two weeks. Okay. Uh, community relations, Ms. Stark. Same. Okay, <laughs> doodle, <laughs> hope to meet. Doodle went out. Okay, uh, district accountability, curriculum, instruction, and assessment, Mr. Schlickman. Yeah, we did discuss the superintendent evaluation, which we uh, uh, then forwarded to the full committee. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, facilities, Mr. Thielman. No report. Okay. Uh, policies and procedures, Mr. Hainer. We met on uh, October 6th, 6th, discussed procedures to address our policy on recent audit. Heard from members on priority of policies that we will be looking at during the year. Our next meetings will be October 20th and November 9th. Okay. Uh, school Enrollment Task Force, we've gotten some report, but is there anything else you want to add? Anybody else want to add from the Enrollment Task Force? Okay. The um, next, yeah. the, just that the next school in our target is Hardy. Is Hardy, yes. Uh, warrant Committee, Mr. Hainer. Everyone get paid again. Okay. Uh, liaison reports. Yes, Mr. Hainer. Uh, CPAC had a coffee at Thompson on uh, September 27th. Uh, Mr. Carden wasn't able to attend, so he asked me to go. Uh, parents got a chance to meet the special education staff. Uh, Dr. Alma was excellent, and her staff were all to be commended. They did a great job. Parents were very positive, especially the new parents. Uh, they felt not only welcome uh, by the CPAC and the staff, but uh, their questions were answered. They were very happy. If I may just continue, yep, OPAC please. had a coffee at Audison to meet the principal and what OPAC does for the new parents. Mm -hmm. Dallin PTO met on uh, October uh, 4th. Sorry, which I, one? Pardon me? Oh, townwide. Uh, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. No, Dallin PTO. Oh, Dallin, yes, sorry. Oh, sorry. I, 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 missed I was her. not able to stay too long, but she had concern on question number two and why they should vote no. Stratton PTO met on October 11th, talked on question two. Parents discussed year and adaptations because of the modular units on the different programs that the PTO does, and they passed the budget. And I'm sorry I was not able to attend the Permanent Town Building Committee on uh, October 4th. Any other liaison and committee reports? No? Um, let's see, I attended the Arlington Youth Health Safety Coalition meeting. Um, uh, mostly we talked mostly it was internal discussion about the coalition um, and we had some like team building stuff and 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 did a lot of that stuff um, the woman who is uh, head of it whose name is absolutely I know her face. Ivy LaPlante ah. Ivy yes is engaged and broke her collarbone oh <laughs> so she was not at the meeting Any right relationship between <laughs> no not at all no she plays like some pretty aggressive sport yep. and uh, ran into somebody and so broke her collarbone. But I think that was after she got engaged. So that was the news <laughs> that I came back from that with. Anything else? And I, I, urge, I, I urge people last time, but two people weren't here, um, that if you are a liaison to either a PTO or another organization, town, and you have not yet made contact with them to sort of reach out and make sure, um, uh, and, and my general feeling is that they don't necessarily want you at every committee me meeting, but they would like to see you and, and have an opportunity to interact with you and liaison with you. Oh, I do have one other thing, yes, actually. Yes, um, I, um, I have, I am going to be working with the library. They're offering a Girls Who Code oh, yeah. um, hmm. uh, offering this year, and I believe that there are still spots open. So um, it's meant the goal of the organization is to close the gender gap in technology mm -hmm. um, by ha incentivizing girls to come and um, really uh, you know, build a group 
of people that they can relate to in technology, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's really exciting. They've grown, you know, year over year over year. Um, when I went to Morgan's graduation, actually, the founder spoke at her graduation, and I was so moved that I, like, looked up where I could do it, and then it turned out that the right here. Arlington Library oh. was looking for facilitators. Um, and so I, along with two other people, so we have three facilitators, which is great. Um, um, and we had a really great open house, and I'm just really excited. I think it's going to be a really great offering, and I hope that you know, we can kind of get the word out. So if people there, it's for girls grades 6 to 12, mm -hmm. and it meets every Wednesday from 3.30 to 5.30 at the library. Mm -hmm. It's free. Great. Um, you don't have to have a computer. We will. So they have computers that kids can have. So, I, if you give me the information, I will ask principals to mm -hmm. get it out in their newsletter. Thanks. Oh, cool! I will send you that. Okay. All right. Yeah, I've seen the information in several different places, but oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. That, so it's definitely been on my radar. Excellent. Yeah. Great. Mr. Hainer. Announcements. Uh, yeah. So let's. So we're done with that. Um, so yes, announcements, Mr. Hainer. Massachusetts Partner for Diversity and PDE in Education had an education conference last Friday was outstanding. You know something's really good if you sit there listening for five and a half hours and the time just takes off. Mm -hmm. I would like to public, publicly commend Dr. Bodie. She was one of the speakers. Uh, it was excellent. And uh, a heavy commendation to uh, Rob. He was one of the coordinators for the program. It, 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 I guess he was a little discouraged with the, the amount of people that came, but the, it, the speakers were fantastic. Mm -hmm. They were, mm -hmm. it was just a wonderful time. And if they are offered again, I would recommend any member of the committee. Okay. Um, other announcements? Okay. Uh, so future agenda items, Mr. Hainer. I would like to see a financial report at the next meeting. Uh, I, I understand part of the thing, but uh, we're already, we'll be at a point with two months into the year. And uh, I would like to recommend to the committee that we might not need them on a monthly basis or even a, a, a weekly, quarterly, uh, is, is, unless something big comes up. Yep. Uh, but uh, a detailed one, so I'm requesting it. I would love to be able to provide that at the next meeting, but I probably could at the following. Uh, the person we have hired to complete the state report either finished today or will finish next Thursday, and then she said she would um, work on that. Okay. Just putting it on your radar. Yep. Yeah, it's, it, uh, it, believe me, that one is <laughs> I'm on sure my it's radar. On radar. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, other future agenda items. Yes, Mr. Cardin. Uh, I was hoping we can get a more detailed report on the uh, the AHS building pro process. There's sort mm -hmm. of a mm -hmm. checklist of things that we are yep. supposed to do in this phase, and it would be nice to get a list of where what we've submitted, what we still have to submit, and what's left to complete this this uh, stage. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yep. Um, okay, so let's quickly discuss then the um, calendar issue. So as I said, we have um, the parking issue because there will be high school conferences at night. This is, the issue is on Thursday, the 17th of November. Um, so that's an issue that couldn't be solved by maybe putting out cones or some other issue. Um, but it also is the AYCC gala, and I know that lots of members of both the community and, and, and our committee uh, like to go to that. And so do we want to entertain shifting that meeting? And just to talk to you about calendar, we have a meeting the immediate, the week before because of the sh short time period because of Thanksgiving. So we probably, for example, wouldn't want to have it on the 15th because it would be only days since our the previous meeting. Um, we might want to entertain having it early the next week. What is what do people think? Mm -mm. Thanksgiving. Week. It's, it's Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving it's, weekend. It's tough. No. Mm. Uh, yeah, Mr. Hainer. I, I I know it. We were going to have it on the 17th. Is it are the members amiable to the 16th? Yes, I'm fine with 16th. 16th is a Wednesday. Mm -hmm. That's fine for me. That's the Vision 2020 on education. That night. Yeah. Oh, it is right. I was like, I have something down the calendar. I was trying to figure out what it was. Yeah, that, it is. It is. It's that the. Won't work. That won't work. How You're right. The, how about fifteenth? Well, the fifteenth. So again, we, we Four could. Four days from the last. Right. Time we so met. we had we have it on the tenth. <laughs> um, right. We already have a meeting on the tenth. Um, so you don't think that the Monday, the twenty-first, for example, would be the time a time that we could do something? No. No. 
No. Oh, because well, you are uh, out. We, 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 you. we traditionally, I, I, we, yeah, I don't know what the plan is going to be this year, but we traditionally take the week before Thanksgiving off. We do, but, but we have a no, special no, issue. No, personally, oh, you personally, yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah, travel yeah, on that yeah, week. Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. What about December 1st? December 1st. Or oh, actually, that yeah, ends up giving yeah, us three we're in a row. The eighth, and then we're going to have the, the yeah. we're going to have three weeks in a row, but a bing, yeah. bang, boom. We Why can pretend we it's November 31st. Well, Why don't we just see how far we get on the you know, 10th? Okay. Right, right actually. What we get done on the 10th of we, November. Uh, mm -hmm. So well, try to sh shove everything into the 10th. We, the, we talked about possibly having it. The problem is yeah. that this is getting into the timeline when we're going to be having principals coming in right. and giving us their budget requests and things, and they have to be scheduled ahead of time. So right. we right. have to we have to make a decision. Um, so either we, we eliminate a meeting or we move it or something, but we right. need to make a decision. Do we have a timeline and of how many, you know, what you want my, for principal yeah. presentations? Idea. It's usually taken mm -hmm. two nights, mm -hmm. um, splitting this, you know, elementary and secondary plus department well, Why don't we get a report from the budget subcommittee on what the time, what, what, what has to happen and when yeah. it has to happen, and then we can make a decision. Yeah. Well, we have a budget calendar. So, I mean, we have. That's what we're going to do next. So, let's see. Uh, we did talk tonight about, um, at an earlier meeting, about um, that the superintendent evaluation may not take us long. So, we could maybe shove more things into the early November meeting. We can mm -hmm. pretend, but we might, well, just as a warning, we might make it a <laughs> much longer meeting than, it, than normal. Yeah. Because we do have sort of expectations of things that we're trying to get happen in November. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, Mr. Rainer. Why don't we wait for the budget calendar and that aspect of it there to make okay. a decision. Okay. If we do the first, we have one on the first, the eighth, and the 15th. Mm -hmm. so right, that's, that's a lot. Yeah. Laura, and, Laura and I are at a conference mm -hmm. that night. On, on the, the first. first. On the first. On the first. Okay. We, okay. Do not, yeah, we, we can do, do all sorts of things if you're not here. We do not have a meeting on the 15th. Yes, we, we, we scheduled, we we scheduled for the right. 15th, and that's yeah. the 22nd. The yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But not yeah, we've got. Okay. We did all I sorts of things when that. we weren't home. <laughs> when you weren't. Oh yeah, so we have right, nights. right. So December, but, two nights in December works. I mean, so I'm, oh, I'm saying you don't need to wait for the budget calendar. Right, but if we added a third one instead of the 17th of November. In other words, put the right. But that right. isn't going to work because but Dr. Bordy just said. She I think the question is, can we get through the things we want to get through in November in one meeting? And my point is, yeah. budget's not the constraint. Budget's not here. constraint. Budget's okay. Right. Right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Then yeah. Budget's yeah. okay yeah. because it will use the. Okay. December. So, let's, so let's just cancel the meeting. So okay. Well, let's. So what I think is potentially we could do is that we could just have an extra long meeting on that first if meeting, needed. if needed. Uh, but you know, I don't want to just. I don't want to not. Consider something that we would normally consider in November. Um, uh, potentially, we can fit everything into that first meeting and cancel that other meeting, potentially. But mm -hmm. we'll get a better sense mm -hmm. soon. Okay. Okay. So let's leave it at that. Okay. Um, so we have um, executive session now, right? Mm -hmm. So um, do I, I, I? I'm I'm confused about. Do I read this first mm -hmm. and then we vote? Okay, excellent. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you, thank, bye. Uh, and thank you to our student rep. I ho hope we see you again, or your colleagues. Executive session, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel, or contract negotiations with union and or non-union, in which if held in an open meeting, may have a detrimental effect. To do, conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Collective bargaining may also be conducted. Uh, we need to approve the MOA for two additional AEA stipends at OMS and vote to point, approve the following executive session minutes, September 22nd, 2016. Okay, so we're going to do a roll call uh, to go into, oh no, we need a motion so first. Moved. A motion from Mr. Schlickman, seconded by Mr. Hayner, to go into executive meet, um, committee. Um, we'll start to the roll call. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Yes. Right. Dr. Asmanvi. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. 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 Are we coming out? Uh, we are not coming out, nope. right? Do we, we don't need have to, to vote well, the do MOA. Do we need to vote the MOA that? afterwards? Yeah, I mean, it's. So we need to come out. It'll just yes. take. Okay. Come yeah. out for the okay. Yes. Okay. So yeah. we will be coming out of executive session. 
and just, just for the purpose just for the of purpose voting. of the vote it sounds like mm -hmm. okay great okay Yep. Okay, so we need to vote on two items. Um, one. We need to vote on one item. Sorry about that. We don't need to vote on releasing the minutes. No. Yeah. Okay. Move. We need to vote on um, the agreement between the Arlington Education Association and the Arlington School Committee. S uh, move to accept the memorandum of agreement with regarding to stipends at uh, Audison Middle School for Spanish and uh, Latin. 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 Yes. Okay. Second. Okay, second by Mr. Seisman. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, motion to adjourn. Motion. Anyway, okay. <laughs> motion to adjourn. Um, by, seconded by uh, Mr. Uh, Thielen. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, great. <laughs>